Okay, so it looks like most of our attendees have gotten into our webinar. So we're gonna go ahead and get you guys started. Um, I'm Karen Collins. I'm one of the counselors from the Center for College Planning at the NEAF Network. And tonight I'm joined by my colleague, Michelle Lavelle. Michelle, you wanna introduce yourself as well? Hi there, everybody. My name is Michelle Lavelle. I am the director and a co-founder for Granite State Home Educators. So we're, th we're thrilled you could be here tonight. And I love working with Karen. You're in for a really good and informative time tonight. Thanks for joining us. Perfect. So tonight we're going to be talking about early college planning. Um, so really, this is appropriate for, you know, parents and students who are eighth graders really all the way through 11th grade. And maybe some of you are parents of younger students too, and that's totally fine. Um, this information um, is never too early in the process, I don't think. So we're just glad that you're able to be with us tonight. So again, I'm from NEIF. Um, the Center for College Planning is uh, a place where you can work with our counselors and uh, get free college planning advice and information. We work with students in kindergarten all the way through college age students, um, talking about the whole college and financial aid process. So um, we work one on one with students really starting more in the high school, pretty much in the junior year to do college prep appointments. We do appointments where we help families to file the FAFSA, which is the paperwork that you need to file in order to qualify for federal financial aid. So we do that right, well, usually in our office, but these days um, we are actually doing that via Zoom. It's been working out great. Um, so we will continue to do that through this academic year um, in order to be sure that we're social distancing and not um, having us out at different schools each night and carrying our germs from place to place uh, to keep everybody safe. So again, tonight we're gonna talk early college planning, but if you have questions about um, you know, financial aid or you have older students who are gonna be filing the FAFSA, let us know and we can help you with that as well. All right, so let's jump in. Um, again, the Center for College Planning, I should have had this slide, I'm sorry, up as I was talking. We do a lot of different things, certainly presentations just like this one. Um, if you have a junior in high school, we have a program called Destination College. It's a day of college planning workshops and we have a big college fair where about 80 or so colleges come and the students can visit with those college reps. This year will be online. Um, we are going to be having a virtual event and registration for that will begin actually February 1st, so next Monday. Um, we do the college counseling appointments, as I said. We have summer boot camps. These are kind of fun. Um, they are workshops for students. They can come and they can really get started on writing the college essay. Um, Angela is one of our counselors and she's so amazing with the students. So she kind of gives them the ins and outs of college essays and then they get started writing and they can meet with, we have um, college representatives there from the admission offices around the state and they help read the essays that the students are working on, help sit down and kind of um, narrow down topics that a student might wanna write about. So we kind of have meetings with those college reps throughout the day as, as they go through that workshop. Um, and we do have a webinar series that's going to be starting this summer for students and parents um, in that summer boot camp vein as we get along. Again, I said FAFSA filing. So this is something that we can sit with families and we file that financial aid paperwork. And um, we also have what's called funding options appointments. This is kind of once you've filed that FAFSA and you've received your financial aid awards from the colleges, and you're kind of looking at them and trying to figure out exactly what they say in English. Um, sometimes there's a lot of wording that's complicated. They don't all look exactly alike. So we can sit down and kind of go through all of those with families and talk about the various ways that you might look for funding, um, that you can understand each part of those, um, those awards that you receive from the different schools. So lots of stuff um, that the Center for College Planning can offer to you. And we hope you'll you know, jump in and take advantage of all of those. So what I'm gonna do, we're gonna start with um, the earlier years. We're gonna start with middle school and early high school years and kind of work our way up to what's to come in that junior year um, as you really start that college process. So what can students be doing and what can families be doing to support their students as they're you know, beginning this process in, in middle school and, and into early high school? One of the biggest things is to really prepare themselves academically um, so that when they get to that college level, they're ready to rock and roll. So we want to encourage students to not just look at what's required in order to get a high school diploma, um, but also to challenge themselves 
kind of beyond, maybe a little bit beyond maybe their comfort level sometimes um, to take a couple of courses that they're really interested in in an upper level situation. So for our homeschooling students, you know, there's lots of different options in terms of how you're receiving that coursework. Um, some students are, are looking at VLAX courses and there's certainly a lot of um, advanced coursework that you can do through VLAX. Some of our students are looking at early college programs um, at the colleges themselves. So there's lots of ways to do that. But again, challenging themselves is probably gonna be one of the best things that our students can do to be ready um, for what the colleges are looking for. And, um, you know, advocating, you know, students can, I think for, for our homeschooling students, you don't have to advocate so much with a school counselor because you're helping to prepare their curriculum, obviously. So um, just making sure that you um, maintain all of their options beyond high school by taking things like world languages, because a lot of the colleges will require um, two to maybe three years of a world language. And usually they want that same world language. Um, so if a student starts with Spanish, they want them to have two to three years of that Spanish language. You can certainly add another one in at that point, but um, to have that two to three years of that one language is gonna be important. And then for most students, algebra two is probably a good target to get through in terms of math. Um, but for students who are considering engineering, um, maybe something in the medical field, nursing, those types of fields, um, they're going to want to get through pre-calculus and maybe even higher, depending on the colleges that you happen to be looking at. So um, knowing, or if you have any idea of what your student might be looking to major in is going to somewhat drive, you know, what, where they're going with that coursework that they're engaging in as they go through that process. Lab sciences are another piece that can really keep a student out of a particular college or maybe a particular major at that college. Um, I read admission files for Northeastern and for students that are looking into engineering, for example, they have to have um, math through a level four. So like at least through pre-calculus or calculus level, they do need to have um, physics and chemistry in order to qualify for that engineering major. So, you know, we do have a lot of questions and I'm sure Michelle, you hear this as well. Um, do I need to take chemistry if I want to be an engineer? I'd really rather take this other course. Um, chances are yes, that college is going to actually require that course um, in terms of getting into that particular major. Not necessarily for the school, but for that particular major. So really just kind of mapping out where you're heading with your coursework is gonna be something that um, is gonna really help to preserve those options as our students go forward. Michelle, did we have any questions about that? I know that, I think I had seen some comments. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. Uh, so I'll answer, we'll ask the first one that popped up, but then I've got a follow-up. Good. Uh, so <laughs> question is, does ASL sign language count as a world language? Yeah, you know, it does actually. So the colleges are really, um, really great about that. It's not particular to a certain language, but ASL is definitely one that um, is part of that that equation for sure. Great question. Okay. The other question uh, is how would a homeschooler indicate that the student is in the highest level course? So right. a, a regular algebra versus an honors algebra or even, you know, something more rigorous than that. How do you make those right. distinctions for a homeschooler? Yeah. So, you know, what's really great about college admission professionals is that they're used to seeing all kinds of different transcripts, all kinds of different ways of presenting um, that curriculum that a student has engaged in throughout their four years of high school. So in our office at Northeastern, for example, we have people that that is their job to read those transcripts that are either competency-based or their narrative transcripts or their homeschool transcripts or maybe even international transcripts. So there are really, really well-trained professionals that are looking at this. So it's not a novel thing in the admission office. So that's one really good thing. The other thing is, is that if I ever have a question about that, I'm going to be in touch, you know, and, and contact um, in this situation, you know, if it's mom teaching that math course, I'm going to contact mom and I'm going to say, you know, do you have a syllabus that you go by or do you have, you know, what types of content have you covered in this course, if there are any questions. So that is a good question. Um, 
we did a, a presentation too where we had some admission counselors that came and talked about putting together a transcript yep. for a homeschooling student. And again, their their idea was is that you know be as accurate as you can, indicate it however makes the most sense for you on that transcript. And maybe you put something on there that this was something that you taught at a more regular rigorous level than maybe the English course that, you know, your student was engaging in, for example, because this is a real strength of your student. Um, so you can indicate that on the transcript as long as you tell them what that indication means. So if you put a little star, tell us the little star means honors or AP or whatever that may be. And we're gonna, we're gonna understand that. Um, so yeah, that is a really good question. So it is a little more challenging, but, um, but certainly colleges are prepared to understand that. Super. Very good. All right, so let's talk about um, starting point for students. You know, one of the things that we do in our office or that I did when I was a school counselor and I started to meet with my high schoolers as we were gonna talk with them about this whole college process and understanding where they wanted to head with their career. Um, you know, we always ask our students, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Um, they don't have to choose a major before they head to college. It's not necessary. Um, it's not required. Certainly a good 50% or more students apply as um, undeclared students um, made or majors as they come into a college and they kind of make that determination as they go along. I think I've seen more of a trend though, um, especially in this past year with things being as crazy as they have been, um, where families feel a lot more comfortable if their student has some idea where they're headed. Um, they wanna make sure that their financial investment is solid. So they wanna make sure that that college has these particular majors or these ideas of majors that these students might have um, and that the courses that they're engaging in are getting them towards that major. So thinking about this, you know, for middle school and, and early high school students is something that is really important. So, you know, students obviously, you know, one of the first things we talk to them about are, you know, what do you like to do? What are your strengths? You know, you as parents, if you're homeschooling your students, you can kind of see that, you know what their strengths are maybe better than um, other parents who maybe aren't as engaged in that learning process with their students. So you can see kind of what their strengths might be a little better. Um, but what does your student really like doing? You know, what could they see themselves doing, you know, in the future? I think for, in, you know, in this day and age, job shadowing and, and doing career interviews is a little tougher. Um, we don't necessarily send our children out into, you know, the hospital right now to shadow a surgeon or, you know, a physical therapist to see what they do every day. Um, but maybe career interview might be something more appropriate during this COVID time um, where somebody in the business field or somebody who is a teacher might have a few moments to talk with your student in a Zoom interview and maybe answer some questions. I think until we can really see what a job entails or until we can really understand what it's about, it's hard for our students to make these choices. And I will tell you that um, they change their minds <laughs> even as they go, right, Michelle? <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do change their minds because their worlds are opened up a bit more when they get to college. You know, my older daughter went to college for elementary um, education and special education. And in her junior year, um, she was placed in a school for students with autism and she loved it. And one night she called me at probably 1130 crying. And I said, oh my gosh, what has happened? And she said, um, I don't know if I wanna be a teacher exactly. I think I wanna be a BCBA. So a behavioral board certified behavior analyst who would work with these students um, in one area would work with students that, that have autism. So um, I said, okay, so what's the panic? Well, I have to apply by tonight because I can do the five year <laughs> program on campus. And my professor said I should do it, but I don't know if I should. And it's gonna be, I don't know. I said, do you want to do this? Yes. I said, then you do it. You know, we'll figure out the money later and we'll make it work. But um, so you might get those panicked calls of, oh my gosh, I just found what I wanna do, but I have to do it by one minute from now. Um, they learn things. I didn't even know what a BCBA was necessarily before she was placed in that setting. And I don't think she did either. So they'll learn more like kind of side things that, you know, kind of go with their strengths and their interests. And it might be, you know, along with their original interests, but, um, but those are great things, you know, that they're learning and moving in the direction that they love. So, um, 
you know, we always, we do start a lot of our students that come to us with, <clears throat> excuse me, a career interest inventory. Um, my next move is just one of those many um, interest inventories. If you look on our website at um, neef.org, you can see it at the bottom of the screen there. Um, there are others that, that students can use, but it's kind of a bunch of questions that our students engage in things like, I like to work with my hands or I don't. I enjoy working outside or inside. I would like to sit at a desk all day or I really wouldn't like to do those kinds of things. Um, and then it moves on to a little bit more complicated questions, but they essentially get a listing of, you know, some careers that might make sense for them. So it's a good place to start, but these are things that um, students can really be starting to think about and starting to, you know, whereas, you know, our middle school and our early high school students may not be working in the summertime, that might be a time that they can explore some of these things as well. Or even, <clears throat> excuse me, do an early college um, experience on a campus. They do a lot of those. Um, some of them are free. Some of them are thousands of dollars. You don't need to pay thousands of dollars um, in order to have your student attend one of those. But, you know, there's a lot of free programs in the area where a student can spend, you know, a little bit of time on the campus and start to learn about what college life is going to look like or some particular majors. There's ones that are devoted to engineering or to nursing or to the health fields, and they can um, spend some time and, and learn some information about that as well. Do we have some questions about that? No, but I wanted to encourage parents to the extent that they're able to utilize job shadows or career interviews, absolutely go for it or volunteer experiences mm -hmm. or anything like that. It actually can count towards homeschooling at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's something called in the public schools called uh, uh, ELOs, extended mm -hmm. learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And more recently, there's a program called Learn Everywhere, which is like an ELO, but at the state level. So it is exactly that where even the public school students are recognizing these outside the classroom learning experiences for credit. So this can serve a double purpose for homeschoolers to learn about potential career options for them and earn homeschool homeschool credit you know so at the same time so that's great we do have a question that's come in that says where where can they find information uh regarding those free programs i presume you mean the college free oper uh, on campus experiences do you have a list of some of those on your website karen no i i don't believe we have a list of those we did at one point but i think we might have pulled that down now so that we can revamp it because i think it was a bit old Okay. Um, I have in the past working with students kind of Googled that and found a lot of local resources. Um, I know the University of New Hampshire does summer programs for students. Um, really, the majority of our campuses here in the States have some type of early college or um, career targeted programs on their campuses in the summer. So start local, you know, because it's something that you could commute to. Some of them, you know, may also house your student um, for that week if they, you know, if that's an opportunity that they can take. But I would st sadly start with Google and, um, and check those out for sure and see if you can meet your interest that way. Perfect, thank you. Great, so here's the fun one. So preparing students for standardized <laughs> testing. This is the one that they all love so much. Now, standardized testing, you know, typically parents, we know um, of the ACT and the SAT test, colleges um, will accept either or. So if your student is more inclined to look at an ACT test versus an SAT test, that's totally fine. SAT just happens to be a New England based product. So, you know, more of the schools up this way are more familiar with it, whereas ACT is more of a Midwestern um, Southern product. So a lot of the schools out that way know that one better. Colleges will take either or that it does not, no preference whatsoever. But sometimes students feel more comfortable with the format of one versus another. Um, I always encourage students to perhaps even take one of each um, in the spring of their junior year to see what they kind of feel more comfortable with, um, or even go online to the websites and take a practice test and see what they feel more comfortable with, and then kind of focus their attention um, to one or the other. Now, here's the caveat with all of this. Um, with COVID, um, a lot of the colleges have gone test optional. Um, so students are not having to submit their test scores. I mean, the, I would say the great majority of colleges for this fall's applicants 
have gone test optional. Students were unable to take that test whether they wanted to or not. They really could not find a testing center um, to accommodate them. So um, the colleges were not requiring standardized test scores. Now it'll be interesting to see where this goes from here um, for our upcoming years for our students that are younger than, you know, than this year's uh, junior class or senior class. Um, some of the schools went test optional as a trial for two to three years. So we know that for the upcoming couple of years, they're gonna still remain test optional, but some it was really just for this particular um, senior class. So stay tuned a little bit on standardized testing to see what happens. Um, the College Board has announced that SAT2 subject tests um, and the essay portion of the SAT test is going away. So that can be a little tricky um, in terms of homeschooling because that was one place where this is standard test across the board, whether you're in California or you're in New Hampshire, or whether you're in a public school setting or a private school setting or a charter school or you're homeschooled, yep. you're all taking the same tests. So when those test scores would come in, I think you know some schools would look at those a little bit more heavily to get a baseline of, of where these students were. So now you're not having that opportunity to write the essay or to take those subject tests, which is a really um, good way to demonstrate your proficiency in a certain area. You know, so if you're looking at a, you know, engineering program and you took a chemistry and a physics subject test, that's really helpful to those college admission representatives. So what's going to happen with that? Um, again, we have found and, you know, in talking with college admission representatives, they have found that um, they don't have to have these tests necessarily um, to make their decisions because they can really look at your, you know, what you have taken course-wise and how you have done in those, you know, courses, what you have learned and really make a pretty good decision as to our prediction as to how you're going to do on campus. So they have that data to back them up. So I don't know for sure what's going to happen. Um, stay tuned as we go forward in years, you know, we're going to be making sure we have the college presentation for high school juniors coming up and, you know, we'll be, we'll be doing presentations all along as you move up in your, your school years. Um, and I'll have more information at that point, but, um, but do stay tuned and, and know that um, standardized tests could be shifting just a little bit in, as in terms of what um, students are going to, or colleges are going to be looking for from their students. Now, if standardized testing isn't your student's thing necessarily, and it isn't all of our thing, um, there are schools that have been test optional and will remain test optional. There's probably a thousand plus schools. And there's a website, it's called fairtest.org, that you can visit and see that whole list of colleges that don't require standardized tests at any point from their students. So this is a piece of the college review process, but it is not the piece of the college review process. They're gonna be much more interested in what your student has accomplished in a four-year transcript rather than just in a four-hour test, you know, so. Most of these test optional colleges ask for an extra essay or extra information from homeschoolers. So if a homeschool student is looking for a way to not take these tests, for whatever reason, whether it's test anxiety or, or mm -hmm. they just want to showcase their talents in a different way. Many of these schools have an alternative way or requirement uh, to accommodate homeschoolers for that. That's amazing. Yeah, that's really important to know. Um, they will get the information. They will make sure that they are, they have enough information to evaluate appropriately for the students. So that is a good point. Um, Testing wasn't my favorite thing. So I, I get that if it wasn't yours either. <laughs> if we can go back that, to that other slide, I've got a couple questions. So oh. it's my understanding that there are ACT subject tests available. Are they considered on the same basis as the SAT two subject tests? Because they're they're different. They they, they don't are. seem that like this as an example for folks, the science test subject test for ACT seems to clump all of the sciences into one test. It's not divided into chem and right. physics and things like that, the way the SAT people did it. So mm -hmm. is that a fair enough equivalent for somebody looking to still have that objective test score to share? I mean, I think it's a, it's a way to share. I don't think it's necessarily the exact equivalent of those SAT two subject tests, which really dig deep into what did you learn in the courses that you've taken. 
um, and can, how do you demonstrate that? But is it better to have some of those potentially for some of the schools that are looking for another way to evaluate? Yeah, I would say that it is. Okay. Um, but you're probably going to be more familiar with that SAT2 subject. Yeah. So the other question I have on tests is there is something called the classic, uh, what is it called? Classic learning test. It's a small, yeah, classic learning test. I'll share a link in the chat box for folks. It is a smaller alternative, mostly in use at private liberal arts colleges. Uh, it's often, um, it is intended to be a, an a alternative to the ACT and SAT, uh, but the list of schools that recognize this as an admissions test is much smaller. You know, it's just, you know, uh, last I happened to look, and it was a, maybe about a year ago, it was several dozen, but these were more uh, small liberal arts schools, uh, many of them religious based. So right. that it's might be an alternative for some families. And uh, it's not related to common core knowledge. That might be an influencer for folks. Yes. And uh, what's interesting is that the CLT folks also offer a level eight, eighth grade test and a level 10th grade test. Mm -hmm. So families can potentially use that for their annual year end assessments or practice tests before they get to, uh, you know, looking at college admissions exams. But it's uh, an interesting alternative out there for families. Well, that's good to know. And I actually just wrote that down because I was not aware of that. See, I always learn something it's great. <laughs> um, when I do these presentations with, with others. Um, it's nice to have that collaboration, but I will, I'm writing that down and I'm going to check that out tomorrow. So um, that is great to know. Um, I think that is a helpful piece for, for a lot of our families for sure. So I'm going to transition a little bit into the college search process and what you might have ahead of you. Um, one of the things to be thinking about, obviously, in this college search, what are what are these colleges really looking for in a student? You know, what are what are they hoping to see when they're admitting their incoming class? So one of the pieces, and and probably the piece that is most important. You know, I've worked at, for different, many different colleges, and for each of those colleges, whether it was a highly competitive like a Northeastern, or it was. Um, you know, more of a, a non-competitive campus, um, like a school I worked for in Boston, um, we always pulled that academic record first. So that transcript is the first thing that gives us some indication of how is this student going to do once they're here? Are they going to be able to meet the challenges that are gonna be necessary to be successful on this particular college campus? So they're not evaluating it based on other campuses, they're only evaluating it based on their own and what they know um, in terms of what makes a student most successful coming into their campus. So again, you know, here's where you want to demonstrate that you have challenged yourself and that you are ready for that college level work. So, you know, the student coming in and meeting the requirements for admission is good. Students coming in that have exceeded those requirements for admission is even better. So, you know, if they're requiring an algebra two, but you've taken pre-calculus, that's great because we know that you've gone above and beyond that and that you're even that much more prepared for that particular program that you're applying to. So um, solid academic records is really the biggest piece in the whole puzzle. It's a four year you know, uh, story of how a student is done. Does that mean that a student needs to be perfect in all four of those years? By no means. <laughs> Does that mean that a student needs to be perfect in all four of those years? nor do you need to be perfect in any one of those years. Um, it is a four-year progress. And when students are younger, you know, entering their freshman year, um, they're at a different maturity level than they are in their senior year. So sometimes those grades or um, the coursework that they're taking is not quite as rigorous, not quite as challenging in that freshman year, but it progresses right along as they go into that senior year. Um, it may mean that the grades drop a little bit towards that senior year because they're challenging themselves more now. And that is a normal trend to see with students. So um, keep kind of those things in your mind. You know, they're really just looking for that challenge level, the ability of a student to say, it's not my favorite thing in the whole wide world to take physics, but I know, you know, that this is going to help me out and I'm going to take it. And I might not have been my favorite and the best, but I, you know, got myself through it. I sat more with mom or dad 
and I really work through those challenges. Um, and that's something, you know, that you would be able to attest to, too, with the admission office saying that, you know, it was a challenge, but hey, they met it and they're ready for the next one um, as college comes along. Again, standardized test scores are more important at some schools than others, um, particularly the larger, more competitive schools where they have this great big applicant pool coming in. Um, that is the standard thing that they can look at across the board. Again, a student from California, a student from Alaska, and a student from New Hampshire, I'll take SATs. I can look at those scores and get an idea of where they fall, those three students fall. Um, whereas it's much more difficult to, you know, look at transcripts and, you know, even different high schools, different homeschoolers are going to have different transcripts. Not a bad thing, but it just is a little bit more work to narrow that pool down. So some of those larger schools with really big applicant pools are going to look a little more heavily at standardized test scores, whereas your small liberal arts colleges are probably not going to look quite as heavily at those standardized test scores. So they're a piece of the process. And again, stay tuned because they may be um, less of a piece of the process as we move forward. Um, colleges are also really very interested in the personal attributes that a student has to offer and that they're going to bring with them onto that college campus. Um, that campus is made up of so many different students. So it used to be that we would say, you need to be a well-rounded student in order to be admitted to these college campuses. That's not really the case, and that's not really what colleges are necessarily looking for anymore. They're really looking for students who are doing what they do, that what they love, and they're doing it really well, and they're really involved, and maybe they've progressed themselves as they've gone through. You know, maybe your student is a Boy Scout, for example, and they stick with that all through high school. It's not necessarily the most popular thing in the whole world for students to stick through, you know, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts through high school. But, you know, maybe your student has and they become an Eagle Scout, which is that highest rank that they can possibly be. That says a lot about a student to an admission office. They stick to it. They've, you know, done a really big project to get that Eagle Scout. Um, so those are things that speak to an admissions office. But does that Eagle Scout also have to be the president of this or the, you know, the athlete too? No, because these are the attributes that that student is going to bring onto the campus. We'll get those attributes from another student and we're going to put you all together and all together, we're going to make sure that that campus has all of those personalities and all of those talents. Um, I think, you know, when you look at the common application, students get nervous because there are 10 spaces where they can list things that they've been involved in. So I read some of these and I'm like, yep, you stretch to get every one of those 10 filled in there. You know, you don't need to do that. Um, students do not need to be involved in 10 activities in order to get admitted to a college campus. If you have three or four or you have two or three activities that you are deeply committed to, that is awesome. And you do not need to stretch those out to come up with more to fill those 10 spots. So really, um, you know, what a student does is, is great, but um, their deep commitment is, is even greater. So they're gonna look at that. Colleges are also um, really looking at character. Um, this year and really the past couple of years, they're really talking about character as part of that review process. So where that kind of comes out are in places like the college essay and those letters of recommendation. So when somebody is writing a letter of recommendation for students, you know, I'm kind of in my mind, almost highlighting words as I'm reading those saying, oh, wow, yeah, that's great, leader. Oh yeah, great, um, selfless. You know, these things, you know, you're reading these different things and you're kind of forming a picture of that particular student. The college essay is the same thing. You know, when I'm reading that, I'm getting a picture of who is a student and, you know, what might they be like on our college campus? So those are the places that students can be revealed a little bit more in that process. But colleges are really, um, really very interested in that these days. I know it used to be that, you know, the college essay was, you know, eh, I don't know how important that is, but, um, but it's increasingly important for our students to pay attention to that as we go forward. And for students that are, you know, particularly in middle school right now, um, and even early high school, they may try some things out and not do it for long. Um, Again, you know, that's something we see that pattern, you know, is it horrible if you did something for one year and then you moved on? No, um, we don't want you to move on from every single thing you've done, but, um, but you're going to try some things and you're going to find those things that you love the most. And that's okay. Whether that's community service, you can see some of those enrichment opportunities, you know, whether that's community service job, you know, looking and exploring careers, you know, a lot of people will do internships. 
Some students will do research with a college professor. Um, I've been reading files of students who have been doing COVID research um, during the pandemic. So, you know, kind of have to be located near a, a teaching hospital for something like that. And, you know, in New Hampshire, that's a little harder, but, you know, regionally, you know, there are opportunities for students to become involved in. So, Again, younger students, now's the time for us to, to start bringing them to different things that they might be able to engage in. And I think um, I typically see that homeschoolers are really doing that quite a bit. You know, that's really part of their learning process, but it's also just part of um, why they're doing that homeschooling. You know, one of the reasons why they're homeschooling is they're having these different experiences, um, and that is really great. So keep that up. So we have a question. Uh, about grading systems, because as uh, we, we talked about this, we had so I'll share a link in the chat. We had a really great chat uh, back in September yep. with a couple different admissions officers around the state, and we went in quite a bit of depth about transcripts. That was all about transcripts and how to how homeschoolers can make their transcript. Uh, so that admissions officers really understand the ins and outs of your homeschool program for your child. So I will include the link, but if you can kind of encapsulate or summarize what those comments and tips were from our admission panel, uh, what would you have to suggest to people about distinguishing grading systems and how mm -hmm. a family should prepare that transcript? Yeah. I, I think, you know, again, grading systems differ so greatly from school to school, you know, even within our state. Um, so these admission offices are very prepared for those differences. So however you're evaluating your student, as long as we understand what your system is, that's going to be fine. You know, if you're giving LMNOP XYZ, you know, as grades, that's fine, as long as we know what that means um, in the process. Everything typically will get um, recalculated, so to speak, to a 4.0 grading system. Most of the colleges, that's kind of what their base is. So based on what you provide in a transcript and then potentially in a, we call it a school, you know, a profile or a kind of an answer key. What does LMNOP mean? Um, based on that, we're probably going to recalculate that into a 4.0 system um, where an A is four, you know, a B is, is three, a C is two, those kinds of things. So every school, you know, every student will get recalculated into that system so that when we are looking at that and evaluating, we're doing that fairly for the student. But it is also based on, somewhat based on that program that they're enrolled in. So, you know, not every high school is academically the same either. So, you know, a, a private high school might have a different level of challenge, you know, for a student than another. So any way that you can indicate how you're offering those courses to your student. You know, would this be the equivalent of an honors course because they went in above and beyond the normal high school curriculum for algebra two. You know, they were doing it at a more rapid pace or they were doing it a little bit more in depth than what, you know, the, the average um, algebra two class is going to look like. Then indicate that so that they, the colleges can give them um, the bonus points that we would give to students that are in an honors or an AP course. So um, that will help them to make sure that everything is evaluated equally in that process. But again, they're very prepared to do this. Um, and you can, one of the things that was really clear that, you know, Michelle and I learned from, from having that presentation is that it is okay to contact these colleges and really have a discussion about that. And just, you know, if your student is particularly interested in St. Anselm College, you know, it's perfectly acceptable to talk with them and say, you know, my student is a homeschooled student. What is the best presentation? You know, how would you best like that to, to be presented to you? Um, the colleges are very, you know, very much there to help families through that process. What else did they say, Michelle, that I'm missing? Um, I think that's a good, good uh, summary. I'm having some issues with chat going oh, on the fritz for me right now okay so but um i, I will definitely share that link somehow to the group somehow yeah, <laughs> i'll figure it, out a way yeah, but uh, is, if we in have the meantime, to we'll send it um through an email for you guys if we need to i 
it is on the Granite State Home Educators website under the videos link. You'll see it there under additional videos. So it is accessible right on our website already, but I was hoping to put the link in there. But right now, chat is not working for me. Oh, goodness. Okay, well, that's a good time. Um, let me see. Do we have one of the things we can try too is if we can't get chat to work, um, we can use the Q&A and see if that'll work for us. Oh. So if you're not getting through on the chat, families definitely send something through to that Q&A and we'll see if we can um, get in there for that for you. All right, so the next thing to think about is really to start researching what those different options are for education beyond high school. And, you know, there is no right answer for this. You know, I think back, you know, many years ago, we were pushing for our students to all be looking at four-year colleges. And that's not the case these days. I think it's something that, you know, we really want students to consider. You know, if you are looking for a particular um, program and that's a professional or a, or a certificate program or a two-year program, that's where you need to wind up. So I think, you know, exploring what these different options are and where they lead in terms of careers is going to be really important. And it's nice because um, you're all, you know, getting started in this process nice and early to be able to explore some of these different options. Um, there's also programs called Dual NH. Um, that program is where students apply to um, a two-year school in our state, so one of the community colleges, but they also apply to a four-year school at the same time. So they are not starting at that four-year school, but that's where they're landing. Um, once they get there. So maybe a student is looking at a career in business and they're going to start their, their program at NHTI in Concord. They're going to take the first two years at NHTI. All of the courses that they're taking under that program are courses that are then going to transfer to, say, the program at the University of New Hampshire. And they're making sure that these students are advised, take this course, not that one, because that one doesn't transfer. This course you need, this course you need. And then once they get to um, their third year, they transfer on to that you know, campus, whether it be UNH, Plymouth, or Keene in state, and those credits transfer over and they become college juniors. So that is a nice way for some of our students to A, save a lot of money, certainly, um, and B, um, maybe start off, you know, maybe make their baby steps into that college process. You know, they started a two year, then they move on to that four year. NH transfer um, has the same idea sort of behind it. So for those students who do wanna start at a two year school, but maybe don't wanna enroll in that dual NH program right from the start, um, they can use nhtransfer.org. It's a website to check on the courses that they are taking or want to take at that community college to see if it's going to transfer on to the four-year school that they're thinking about. So it's a really nice um, place for them to know that they're taking the right classes and not you know, wasting their time and their money um, taking courses that aren't going to then be part of their four-year program on those campuses. So that's a really great um, program as well. Um, we have students, you know, obviously have the opportunity to be on campus, to commute, to be online. There are so many options for the ways that students can kind of um, structure their college career these days. And it's really um, open to the students to make those decisions. You know, for some of our students, they may want to start commuting and then they may decide they want to live on campus later. Other students who are local students, um, I live in Londonderry, and some of our students go to uh, Southern New Hampshire University. And some of them will live on campus the first year in order to make their friend group form that friend group and have that opportunity to really participate in some of those things. And then they might live off campus, you know, at home and commute for the remaining years because now they already have that group. So they might stay on campus with their friends for the weekend or they might, you know, be involved in some groups and that's a good way um, to, you know, to get started in that process. So there's lots of ways to do this and to save some money, um, lots of opportunities for our students and for our families. Getting to know the schools is going to be another piece of this process. So um, right now, the way that most of our students are having to get to know uh, the schools is really online through virtual tours. Um, most of the campuses across the country have really ramped up their virtual tours. You know, they've always pretty much had those available for students and for families, but now they're um, 
really, really in depth and really um, incredible. So it's, you know, almost as if you are on campus and getting that tour. Um, so that is really great. So hopefully, um, you know, you'll have an opportunity to do some of these tours and it's, you know, there's no um, age limit for many of the schools as to when you can start doing these tours. So, you know, check them out. You can check out their websites. You can request information. They can send you, you know, the pretty view books and the catalogs that you can start to take a peek at. Um, as soon as your students take a standardized test like a PSAT, they're going to start getting marketed from these schools and you'll start to get tons of mail. Um, enough that probably moms and dads, you can, you know, wallpaper your living room with all the pretty pictures from the, the colleges. Um, but I always encourage students, you know, go through them, see if it's a school that you might be interested in, hang on to it. But if not, you can let that one go. Um, attending college fairs is another really great way for families to get started in this process. Again, right now, these are not happening in person where you're going to actually go to a fair, walk around from booth to booth and visit with those college representatives. Um, they are happening online though. And it's kind of the similar process. You can view all the different booths that are available. So if I want to go visit the University of New Hampshire, I can click on their booth and there will be Rob McGann, say the, the director over there might be in their booth and I can chit chat with him and I can get more information and I can click on their videos and, and I can get, you know, gather some information about the University of New Hampshire, get some of my questions answered and maybe leave my name and my address so that they can then send me some further information as they, you know, I make my way through that um, process. So college fairs um, are virtual these days. There actually is um, the NIAC Act, which is the New England College Admission Counselors um, Association is having a college fair, virtual college fair, I think on the 31st, I believe that's Sunday. So that's something that you can register for online at neacact.org. You can go jump on and I think you can register for that fair still um, and visit some of these colleges and get some ideas. Um, visiting campus, we definitely want you to get to campus. Now might not be the time. Some of them are open um, for tours, but you're not going to get inside buildings at this point in time. So because most of you are, you know, families with younger students, this may be the time to do, you know, campus drive throughs You can go and walk the campus maybe for some of them, um, but again, won't be able to get inside buildings just yet. Um, but as you move closer to the process, hopefully with the vaccine out and things moving, um, we'll be able to get back on campus and, and do those actual tours soon. But again, researching is going to be um, something that will take significant time, um, a lot of effort to find those schools that feel right for you and for your student. Um, so investing in this now is a great idea. You know, I, I don't think there's any too early in this process. You know, again, their, their ideas may change as you work along the process, but even visiting schools or even visiting schools online now gives you a better base to build off of. You know, so if you visit a school and it is a large school in the middle of Boston um, and your student says, oh, I don't know, but then you visit another school, maybe it's also in Boston, but it's a gated smaller campus, they feel more comfortable with that, then you have some sense of what you might be looking for in a college campus. So um, getting started is never a bad thing. Michelle, are you back on? And able I'm to back on. Sorry, something went all crazy haywire, but I am back on. The joy I, miss, I missed you all. Uh, <laughs> But I wanted to jump in and say how important those campus visits are. Um, my twins were both engineering bound that they knew they wanted that. But my son said he wanted a big, super crazy competitive school. And that was his thing. And my daughter was talking smaller, cozier environment until she got on campuses and ended up visiting the schools. So um, it made a big difference in where she ended up. Now she's at a big 10 university and about to graduate, but she never would have expected that without that visit. Cause we had done the small local New England campus visits, even when they were freshmen, we, we started it. And it really, she was certain, I'm gonna go to this small environment. That's where I wanna be. At, but until she got to a big 10 campus, go figure. That was exactly our experience too. And we did, and it was a realization really later in the process where my 
we were sitting at a campus at a, an accepted students day and my daughter said, or an open house, I guess it was, so it couldn't have been that far along. Um, and they said something about um, in the education program, the 16 students or something like that. And she would turn to me and she was like, 16? What if I hate 14 of them? What if, what if like I'm weird and they don't like me? Like, I don't know if I can do this. I need a bigger school. Um, that's okay. Um, hopefully your child will make that switch a little bit earlier like your daughter did, but um, but we found her a big school. She ended up at a, a big E school, um, so similar environment. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, it, it's important. It's really important to visit. And I, I know right now, you know, this is a tough thing to say to you because you can't get on the campuses, but um, even doing a drive-by right now is something that you can certainly do for a local campus. Um, and get that idea. I'm, that's what I'm doing kind of with my younger daughter and, and my niece. We're going to do some drive-bys and, and get the sense of what they really like. And then we'll, we'll make the, you know, the list from there. So feel free to, to do those and, and to gather as much information in the process as possible. You know, what was funny for us was even at the Big Ten University, she's in a small major within yeah. engineering. So yeah. her, her little subset her of, <laughs> of people is small and she knows everybody. So mm -hmm. it really depends. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, it does some soul searching on the part of your student to figure out where can they picture themselves, whether it's the big urban environment or a small rural school or, you know, liberal art, you know, it, sometimes they just don't know till they go there and get a sense of where they fit in. Yeah, absolutely. We always encourage that for sure. Um, as your students move up to their junior year, now we start to um, get into the more nitty gritty of the process. And this is where we always tell them that it's kind of time for the student to begin driving their process and to really begin discussing what they think they want in a school, but also maybe to be making those appointments with the colleges to visit, you know, Colleges would rather talk to your student than to you. I, I know that's not easy to take because I still have a problem with that and my daughter's out of grad school, um, but they would. And once they get into college, they really won't talk to us unless our students sign an agreement saying that they can talk to us, even though we pay the bill. Um, so it's good for students to get that, that beginning of taking that driver's seat because if they're on campus and something is going on with financial aid, they're going to need to go in there and chit chat with that financial aid office and, and see if they can get it straightened out. So um, for those kids who are like mine, who don't even order a pizza by themselves, um, it's good to get them started. I always say ease in, have them call the admission office to make an appointment to visit. Admission offices are super nice and they're going to you know, walk them through that whole process and say, oh, you want to visit? Great you know, when are you coming to town? And they'll tell them a date and they'll say, oh, on that day, we have tours at 10 and two, which works for you. And your student just has to say 10 a.m. And then they'll tell them who they are. And <laughs> so it's a really safe um, step into the process, but it's a good one for them to make. And it builds that confidence. Once they get into that application process, again, the student really needs to drive that. So if there's a question about their file, student needs to be contacting that admission office, not mom and dad. Um, it just shows that admission office that this student is ready to do it. They're ready. They're taking control of their process. They're ready to check if their standardized test scores made it to the school or not. Um, they're ready to see if their, you know, letter of recommendation arrived, whatever it may be. So is it the comment, does the common app show where things are in the standing right. for the student? So if your student right. is using that, you can see if the Children. test scores arrived, if the uh, recommendation letters arrived, and it's up to the student to keep tabs on that. Yes, it is. Um, so it's really, I mean, the Common App is a beautiful thing. And, and as we get closer to that time, you know, we'll, we can have a presentation where we just talk Common App too for families um, to kind of walk through that. But, um, but it is a beautiful thing and it really helps the students. But again, they're going to be the ones that are going to have to fill that information out. So it's good for them to, to really start to drive that process. Um, we were talking earlier about, you know, ways that students are, we mentioned a couple of things that students might be able to earn college credit, um, you know, while they're earning their high school credits as well. And I'm probably not the best, you know, I, I can tell you about them, but you probably could tell me back more about this than maybe I can tell you. Um, but the eStart program is one of um, the programs where students can take online college courses. 
Um, they're taught through the community college system of New Hampshire, but there's also what's called um, early college where students can actually take those courses at the community college and earn college credit for those. So a lot of students actually graduate from high school with an associate degree because they've taken um, all the courses that would be required in their final two years of high school and they've earned dual credits. So they've earned high school credits as well as college credits. Um, one of the things that I do know is that the different campuses in New Hampshire um, might offer different courses in that early college program than some of the others. So there are more restrictions as to what a student can take at some campuses versus some of the other campuses in the state. So that's one of the things that you probably will want to get clarified when your student is starting that program to make sure that all of the courses that they would need if they intend to get an associate degree would be available to them as they work their way through that program. Um, and, and again, I don't know which of the schools are more restrictive than others. You know, it's in certain areas and certain majors and all of those things, but that is something to, to be aware of. Um, Southern New Hampshire University also has some online courses that students might be able to take. So there's, oh, I thought I had another slide about um, online. Um, a lot of you are also taking VLACs um, courses. Those are great ways for students to potentially earn some college credit. So they have some dual credits where students can earn um, college and high school credit at the same time. So, you know, if that's something that you're looking for, make sure to enroll in those courses versus just the high school credit courses. Um, that can, you know, certainly be very much worth a student's time. You know, we definitely have a lot of students in New Hampshire who have that associate degree when they're heading off to college, which is nice. It saves you guys a lot of money. Um, it saves your students some time. Um, it's not necessarily for everyone, but it, it is out there for students who really want to do that. In the chat, I just put in a, an announcement that came out in October from the New Hampshire Department of Ed about a partnership they have with Modern States for CLEP uh, courses and tests. They are available free to uh, New Hampshire students. So it's a great way to, it, CLEP by the way, stands for College Level Examination Program. So it's another way to both take the courses and the tests at no additional cost. So that may also be a way to get some college credit and, and again, set your transcript apart from other students and show you have uh, challenged yourself appropriately for the things you wanna pursue in college. Yeah, absolutely, that's a great point too. Um, so I am going to shift gears just a bit. If there are still questions about any of the admission process, certainly, um, you know, send those our way as well. But I want to talk real quick um, about financial aid. I know it's really early in the process, but I know a lot of families are very anxious about um, the cost of college as rightly so. Um, it's not an inexpensive endeavor. So I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, this I call the scary slide. Um, it's not intended to be that, but <laughs> It is a scary slide nonetheless. So this is just giving you an idea of what one year of tuition room and board um, and any fees might look at like at some of our schools here in the state, but also some schools that are out of state. So, you know, a student going to NHTI, for example, you know, your tuition would look right around $7,200 for a student. Um, if you lived on campus, you know, that bumps it up about $10,000 for those living expenses. So you can see where that, you know, where tuition, where room and board comes into play. The student attending Plymouth State is probably going to be about $26,000, whereas University of New Hampshire is about $34,000. There are programs um, through that school. So if a student has lower income and they qualify for what's called a Pell Grant um, through the financial aid process, then those students can go to Plymouth State, the University of New Hampshire, Keene, um, UNH Manchester, free tuition, tuition free. Um, they would need to pay room and board should they decide to live on campus and they would need to pay fees at those schools, but the tuition would be free. So that's something that, you know, if that's of personal interest to you and you're wondering about that, you know, certainly get in touch with me, but all of those colleges also have information about that on their website at the financial aid page, and it is called the Granite Guarantee Program. I wanna, I don't mean to add to everybody's fears and apprehensions, but I can totally tell you, uh, out of state college, you could add probably another 15,000 on top of whatever sure. the tuition is. Yes. Uh, and then of course, you know, just shipping your child out there 
and getting them set up and coming back home for holidays or or when the campus shuts down for covid <laughs> you know you're you're going to have significant additional costs if your child goes out of state uh, or significantly out of state you might be able to keep it down if it's still regional here in new england but heads up i don't want to mislead anybody no definitely not and you can see the difference between the university of new hampshire which is a public school and UMass Amherst, which is also a public school. But if we are one of our students goes to UMass Amherst, we are out of state students. So now we're paying the out of state tuition rate, which is $50,000 a year. Yeah. Now, if you mass, if Massachusetts students go to University of New Hampshire, they're paying a similar tuition, whereas we're paying the $34,000. But just to be aware of that, um, the prices of state schools are not going to be equal out of state as to in state. So um, that is something to consider for sure. Northeastern, $72,000 and Dartmouth all the way, almost up to $80,000 a year. So you can see there's an incredible range um, of cost. Um, there's in, you know, there's in-state schools, there's out-of-state schools, there are public schools and private schools to, to be considered. And I think one of the important things is to, you know, look at all of these different schools. Don't just go by price tag because where Plymouth State University is $26,000 and Dartmouth is $80,000, Dartmouth has a lot of money that they are able to award students in merit scholarship and in grants based on financial need that can bring the cost down quite a bit for families. Whereas Plymouth State, as much as they would love to have tons of money to be able to offer, they are a state institution and we're in New Hampshire. So the funding for them to be able to then offer to the students isn't as great as what Dartmouth would have. So um, students should apply to a variety of different schools as they go through that process. And again, this is all stuff we'll cover with you guys as you get closer, but just to give you a little preview, um, there are two types of financial aid. There is gift aid and there's self-help aid. Gift aid's the good stuff. This is free money. It's money that um, students don't have to pay back when they graduate. On, an, on a financial aid award, you're gonna see the words grant or the word scholarship. Grants are typically need-based, so they're based on a family's finances. And we give them that information on the FAFSA form or on the CSS profile form, which is an additional financial aid form. So based on those numbers, our students may qualify for grants and they could be federal grants or they could be grants from the college themselves. Scholarships are a little bit different. Scholarships are merit-based. So they're based on something our student has done well. And whether that's academic achievement, whether that's athletic achievement, whether it is um, having engaged in a great deal of community service or demonstrating leadership, um, merit-based aid generally comes through the admission process, whereas need-based aid is gonna come through the financial aid process. So we like to see the word grant we like to see the word scholarship on our financial aid awards because again, free money that our students don't need to pay back. Self-help aid, that is a little bit different. That is money that is either needs to be paid back or earned by our students. So students are gonna be offered a federal student loan. Every student is going to get that federal student loan as long as you complete the FAFSA form, the financial aid paperwork. Students can borrow $5,500 in their own name we are not co-signers, we don't show up anywhere on that bill, um, but they can borrow $5,500 in their own name their freshman year, $6,500 their sophomore year, and then it's $7,500 each additional undergraduate year that they would have. So it's junior and senior year, and then if they had another undergrad year, it would be $7,500 that they can borrow. Again, it's totally in their own name, very low interest this year, it's 2.5%. Um, but it's a way for our students to have a little bit of uh, skin in the game, so to speak. Um, they know they need to pay this back, so maybe they get themselves to those lectures on time and, and <laughs> engage in those and take part. Um, it definitely motivated me on those really nice days that you'd really rather sit with your buddies on the lawn. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a way that our students can participate in that process. The federal work study program is something that not every student is going to qualify for. It is based on need. But if a student qualifies, they can um, earn up to a certain amount of money, and that amount of money is going to show up on the financial aid award. So if it says on the financial aid award work study, $2,500, your student will have the opportunity to go to campus, find a job, work a certain number of hours, and earn up to $2,500. It won't come off of your bill. 
but it will go to your student in the form of a paycheck. And whether they decide to then turn that over to the bursar's office as part of their tuition, or you have them use that as spending money so that they're not phoning home and saying, hey, I could really use a hundred bucks um, to do this thing with my buddies. You can say, hey, you have work study. How's that going? You know, <laughs> as you go through the process. So um, different types of aid, you probably will see a combination of all of these things show up on the financial aid award when your student receives those from the colleges. But it's good to know that there are different types. And it's also really good to know that colleges can decide in their own pool of money that they offer to students, they can decide how they award that to students. So if a college says, hey, we are not going to give merit-based financial aid, we're only gonna give need-based financial aid, your student could be a phenomenal student they're still not going to get a merit scholarship at that school because they don't have them. So it's important to kind of know that about schools so that when you're looking, if you are looking for merit scholarships, we're applying to the right schools that actually have those that your student could qualify for. So good to know as you're starting that process. Financial aid is, um, the philosophy uh, is really that it's there to kind of help make college more affordable for us as families but the primary responsibility for paying for college really lies with the family. So um, what they're kind of saying there is we're probably likely to pay something to get our student to college. And what is that something? It's going to be based on completing um, the FAFSA form, which is the free application for federal student aid. And then for some of our families, also completing the CSS profile. These are the two forms that colleges will look for in terms of financial aid. So Every school is gonna look for FAFSA. So whether your student is looking at two years, four years, public, private, in-state, out-of-state, doesn't matter. They are gonna all look for that FAFSA form. You, it's kind of like the common application where you file it once, you name all of the schools your student is applying to, and that gets sent to them electronically. Once you've done that, you're gonna to need to look to see if some of your schools also require CSS profile. Some of the private colleges will use this, and it's typically the more competitive private colleges that use CSS profile in addition to FAFSA to kind of gather more financial information about your family so that they can then award their need-based aid appropriately. So whereas FAFSA doesn't really look at assets so heavily, CSS profile digs deeper into assets. So if on FAFSA, you know, we don't report, say, our home, like that's not considered an asset. Our primary residence is not considered an asset on the FAFSA, but it is on CSS profile. So we have, you know, I might have a million dollar, well, I, I don't, somebody might have a million dollar home, but somebody else might not. That is a considerable asset that somebody would be able to borrow against versus the family that couldn't. So CSS profile digs deeper into that when a college has more money to offer. Michelle, questions about this? I've kind of, financial aid is a, is a good questioning area. Well, people had a few questions follow up about the CLEP program, oh, oh, oh. and uh, the question was, at what age is a student able to plug into the CLEP exams? And I had looked on their F, their FAC, but a par another parent popped in that said, uh, it's open to anybody. So mm -hmm. if you have a very high achieving younger student, why not? You That's know, awesome. you know, go for it. Be be, uh, you know, let your it's one of the beauties of homeschooling. They're not limited to age based grade levels. So if your child can handle mm -hmm. the work, do it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question that says our applications for financial aid do at the same time as the college application. That's a great question. So this is tricky because um, deadlines can be at similar times. So while your student is working on those applications for admission, parents should be thinking about applications for financial aid. So it's kind of driven by how your student's applying to college. So if your student is applying early action, where they apply early, usually before December, if they hear back early from the college, um, then likely you're going to also need to submit that FAFSA in that early time period. FAFSA and CSS profile both open October 1 of the student's senior year. So you can't file before that time, but families can file anytime after that October 1st date. Um, I always encourage families to do it on the earlier end rather than later because we don't want to miss any potential, you know, scholarships or anything that might 
we might qualify for by filing these a little bit earlier in the process. But do you need to do it October 1? You do not. Um, but you need to check the deadlines for all of the schools. So if your student has five schools that they're looking at and the earliest deadline is November, then we want to make sure we do it by that time. So it's really driven by your particular schools. I don't know if I answered that appropriately, but, um, but yeah, driven by your schools. Makes sense. Uh, another question came in is, uh, what about if you live on a fixed income like Social Security? Yep. So Social Security, unless it's taxed, does not go on to the FAFSA form at this point in time. There are big changes coming down. I didn't see that as a change. Um, I was starting to read about that before we came on tonight. But, um, but right now, unless your Social Security is taxed, that information does not go on to the FAFSA form. So it is based on, you know, any other income that might be coming into the home, but not on that. Super, thank great you. Questions. Good, great questions. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how this financial aid is awarded so that you can kind of start to think it through and, and mull it over a little bit in these years while your student is starting to think about college. The colleges will start with what's called the cost of attendance. So that is, tuition, room and board, books, fees, supplies, any related expenses that students might have, those are all going to go into the cost of attendance. So that is gonna be slightly higher than what I showed you on that first screen, you know, the scary slide. Um, it's gonna be slightly higher than that because they're also gonna put non-billable expenses into this equation. The reason they do that is they try to help us to meet, you know, all of the costs of education, not just those billable costs that a family is going to incur. So they're gonna start with the cost of attendance. They're going to subtract off the top what's called an EFC or expected family contribution. When you file the FAFSA form and you press submit, you're going to get a confirmation page right up on your screen. And in the middle of that confirmation, you're gonna see the letters EFC and then a number. And it kind of looks like not much. It looks like a code. But essentially that number indicates um, the amount of money that the federal government has determined based on the information that you provided that your family can afford to pay for one year of the student's college education. So that EFC drives how much aid a student might be able to get at campus. So in this example that's up on the screen, you can see we were probably talking about a small private college, cost of attendance 45,000. If a family's expected family contribution is $16,000, the college says, well, you know what? You can come up with that. That's what they say. You know, it doesn't mean write a check for that, but it means that, you know, we may borrow, we may take some out of current income, we may do a bunch of things to come up with that $16,000. That student is then eligible for $29,000 because they subtract that right off the top of their equation before they put financial aid into place. So students now eligible for that $29,000. Will a college come up with that? Some of them will, you know, it depends on the school, especially if it's a school that meets full need, they will meet that need. How they do it, you know, could be different. Some could be a bit of a loan, it could be some work study, it could be some merit scholarship, um, all tied into that amount. Um, but other colleges aren't going to be able to give you that full amount of $29,000. And then you're left with this gap to pay but you're also paying that expected family contribution. So you kind of have to remember that. So if the gap was say, you know, $10,000 for the sake of easy math um, at this time of night, um, if that gap was $10,000, that's not everything you're paying. You're also paying that $16,000. So they would be looking for the family to come up with, you know, that $26,000 um, as you go forward. So it's a, it's a tough equation. It's tough to, you know, necessarily comprehend that the first time you hear this, we will do financial aid nights as you guys get closer to the process. And I will break this down even further. Um, but I just kind of want families to understand how colleges are doing that and what that might look like. Um, if you want to have a fun time, you can calculate your family's expected family contribution by using an EFC calculator. One of the really good ones you can see up on the screen there right now is at finaid.org. Um, you provide some information and based on what you provide, you're going to get that EFC calculation. It just gives you some sense of where are we starting in this process. Um, does it mean that's exactly what you're going to pay? No, but at least it gives you that sense of we know kind of where we're starting as a family. 
Michelle, I'm sure there's tons of questions. There are, there are a few. So a couple questions about what about uh, parents who are divorced? How does yeah, that an, work? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So when parents are divorced, when you file the FAFSA form, the parent that goes on that FAFSA form is the parent with whom the child resides 51 or more percent of the time. So as it stands right now, it doesn't matter what a divorce decree happens to say. It doesn't matter who claims that child on their taxes. It's really strictly where is that child physically um, in the past year? Where has that child been physically the majority of the time? So that parent goes on the FAFSA form. The other parent, the non-custodial parent, does not appear on FAFSA at all. So they do not show up. Their income does not show up. Um, on the CSS profile, um, that might be a little different. So the custodial parent is still filing as that main parent, but that non-custodial parent may be asked to also submit their own CSS profile form. It's called a, called a non-custodial parent form. And you don't sit down together in the room and hang out and discuss your salaries, but you file those separately. And then the college matches them up in, in the um, financial aid office. Now, here's the one thing. So if the parents are divorced, child lives with mom, say, the majority of the time for the past year. If mom is remarried, then that stepdad is also going to appear on the FAFSA form because it's a household um, income that they're capturing. So um, that information would also go on the FAFSA form. If there are stepchildren in the household, you would count them as dependents in the household as well. So it's a little bit confusing. Um, this is why we file FAFSAs in our office and why we work with you to make sure you have all the paperwork that you need in order to get this um, you know, straight. But that's how FAFSA and then CSS profile, again, would look at custodial parent, step parent if there is one in that household, non-custodial parent, and then step parent if there's one in that household as well. So potentially four parents on CSS profile. So the fun begins, right? <laughs> wow, it gets confusing. Uh, okay. Another question, uh, this one parent says that her husband passed along his post 9-11 GI bill to the child. Yeah. How does that work if the GI bill doesn't cover all of the expenses at a particular school uh, and would it prevent the student from getting financial aid to make up any difference? Yeah, that's a great question. Typically, that's something that you want to work with the individual colleges about um, because how they handle it is somewhat similarly, but they might have slightly different caveats to that is what I've found as I've worked with students over the past. Um, but basically, when that is a situation where there are RGI benefits for the student, they will look at those first, but they will also have students apply for financial aid because if you qualify for some of those things, they're also gonna put those into play for the student. So um, if it doesn't cover the full amount, they can definitely apply for financial aid as well. But I would want you to talk to the individual schools too, because again, they have their process that you must go through and, and work with them. Great. Right. Hey. That's it for the question so far on that. All right, I'll keep us moving because I know we're running long, but um, these are great questions and we certainly want you guys to keep them coming. So another piece that I think is good to know about now as you get started in this process is every college has what's called a net price calculator. These are gonna be located on the financial aid webpage. Sometimes they're a little tricky to find and I find myself putting it up in the search box at, on the college website, you know, just put in that price calculator and then I can find it, but they are there. They're required to be there um, for every college. And these net price calculators um, will give you some idea of what a financial aid award might look like at that particular institution for your student. Some of them are highly sophisticated, so they're gonna calculate not only need-based aid, but based on some of the responses that you provide, they might ask you, you know, um, what is your student's grade point average, for example, and they might also calculate a merit-based aid for your student as well. It's not 100% foolproof by any means. You still have to file the FAFSA. You still have to file CSS profile if the college requires it but it gives you an idea of what your net cost might be at a particular institution, because that's really what you wanna know. You don't necessarily wanna just go by what that overall cost is for school. You wanna know what your student's net price is and compare that to other colleges, because you know Dartmouth may cost $80,000 on paper, 
but your price, once you run a net price calculator, might be $20,000 based on, you know, what they're able to give to your student. They are a college that meet full need. So if you demonstrate need up until, you know, $10,000, they're going to give you everything beyond that in, in some type of um, award. So it's important to kind of have a, a little bit of a sense of that as you go into the process. This is something that I spent a lot of time, you know, on my couch at night, just peeking through some of the schools my daughter was looking at. I will tell you that some of them were so darn accurate um, that it was like, wow, okay, yeah, that is what they gave her. Some of them not quite as much because their calculator wasn't as sophisticated, but it's a great starting place um, for you to know, you know, what might be coming down your way. How do we pay this bill when it comes in? <laughs> um, that's the hard part. And this is where our funding options um, appointments really come into play. Some of the things we talk about with families are, you know, what is the strategy? You know, we have 529 plans saved for our children. Do we use those in the first year? Do we use a little bit every year? Do we wait for the final year? What is your, you know, what would we do in that situation? I mean, if we are not financial planners. Believe me, we are not. I don't pretend to be but we can give you the scenarios and what that's going to look like in terms of affecting your aid in the future. Um, we always say start with savings and current income because it's not money you're borrowing. Um, it's not, incur you know, re getting interest rates, you know, are not involved in anything like that. So if you can do that, it's great. Tuition payment plans kind of spread um, the payments out instead of paying in July for semester one and December for semester two, you can pay over the course of the school year in smaller amounts. So those are kind of nice. You never have to, you know, if you owe $20,000 to the college, you do not need to do a tuition payment plan for $20,000. You could do $2,000 and pay $200 a month and, and you know, find, not have to finance a, a portion of that um, information. So for our students, I, I mentioned that they can borrow on federal student loans. For parents, we can borrow on a federal direct plus loan. So this is sort of our equivalent, except we have different terms. Um, the federal plus loan is going to have a higher interest rate than our students' federal loans. So right now the plus loan is 5.3%, but there's also a four plus percent um, origination fee. So you almost have to borrow 4% more than what you need to get to the college because that 4% fee is coming off the top. It's a really easy loan to get. You go online, you go to studentaid.gov, you use what's called an FSA ID that you've already created because you filed the FAFSA form and they run a credit check on one parent. As long as your credit is good, they say, go ahead, you can borrow. And unlike our students, we don't have the borrowing limit of $5,500. They're really nice and they let us borrow up to the full amount we owe on campus. Um, doesn't mean we wanna borrow that amount, but they, they might allow us to go ahead and do that. It's one way of doing things. Um, there are also you know, a lot of families that will use um, home equity line of credit instead because the rates are so much more competitive. Some families don't feel comfortable having their house as collateral. So it's really, you know, up to the family how they're going to do this. Some families have more than one child in college, or they would rather that the student borrow in their own name, um, which is fair. They are, there are private student loans that our student can borrow. The only tricky thing about that is that um, because our students don't have a $30,000 income every year, um, they are not able to borrow on their own. So they're going to need a co-signer, which typically runs back to us um, as parents or maybe grandma or pop up or, you know, whoever they've got that can, um, you know, act as a co-signer on that private student loan. A lot of times you'll find that the rates on those private student loans are lower than the PLUS loan. So families will, you know, kind of look at both and see, you know, weigh their options out. Um, those loans will always remain in the student's name. Um, usually co-signers are released after students make you know, 24 to 36 payments on time, then co-signers are usually released off of that loan. Um, but it's really a family process of, you know, figuring out what the best thing to do. And I don't know about you, Michelle, but um, we didn't have one process that we used for all four years. We kind of, okay, so this year we've got one in, but then next year you might have a couple in and then, you know, oh wait, we've got to get a new car because the car died. So we're going to shuffle that, what we were going to do. And now we're going to do this. So um, and families' financial circumstances change from year to year. 
you know, it's a reality. So this is nice that you have the options and you're not locked into one set choice for the duration of your child's college process. So uh, it's a, it's, it's flexible. um, And, you know, you can pick and choose, but I, I really love the suggestions you have there in the right hand corner of ways to make this more affordable and the club exams and any other of these dual enrollment credits that your kid can take during high school at a discount all brings down that cost of college too. Yeah, absolutely. I know students who have taken, you know, any number of dual and duly enrolled courses or even AP courses, maybe through, you know, a VLAX where they, you know, have really completed one or more years of their college education already going in. So to save, uh, you know, at a Dartmouth, $79,000 isn't a bad gig. So um, yeah, explore all of those options. If you have questions about that, let us know, you know, we can, we can definitely help you with that, but it, it is to our benefit to be looking at that. And I think families more and more are doing that as, as we're moving along. Um, so that brings me to the end of um, my slides, but we definitely want to answer any more questions that might come in. Cause I know it was not super quick, but it was a lot of information in a short amount of time for, for families to digest there. I don't see any follow-up questions. We are looking really good here, Karen. Awesome. We're stunning, everyone. It's too much. <laughs> Got one more that popped in. Oh, uh, sh- should we begin accumulating recommendations along the way as our children move through their activities, even when as they're younger and not just wait till they're they're, you know, juniors and seniors do, filling out the applications. What a nice question. That's a great question. So here's what colleges look for. So typically they really like to see recent letters of recommendation, particularly academically, um, because they are looking for, you know, a student that is in a traditional high school building setting. You know, they're going to look for that school counselor letter, which is kind of like that global letter. It kind of talks to the students Um, how they interact with their peers, how they interact with their teachers. Are they the student that, you know, is involved in every club and sport or are they more quiet, reserved? You know, those kinds of pieces come from the school counselor. Also things that might have disrupted the student's learning process. So, you know, if a family member was ill, COVID, you know, has been something that we've seen an awful lot of information in those letters um, this year, certainly in the process. Um, so that might end up falling to you as the educate, you know, as the counselor, the educator, the everybody that that's going to be there to give the kind of that global overview of your student. Um, but yes, I think really junior senior year are the times when the colleges would most like to see those letters coming in. If there's something specific that they're involved in, like one of these summer college experiences, it would be totally appropriate for your student to ask that teacher or that professor or whoever's running the program, whatever it might be that, that has that interaction with your student to write a letter and to hang on to that for the future as well. So um, yes and no, but mostly they're gonna look academically, you know, where those teacher letter recommendations would come in. They're gonna look most recent um, to know, you know, how your student has grown and, and where they're at right now coming in. Okay, a couple of follow-up questions about, um, the various homeschool recommendation letters and the guidance counselor recommendation letter. I know we talked about it in really quite a bit of depth at our September discussion. And I just popped the link in there where people can find the video. So you can see uh, exactly what three different admissions officers recommended about the transcripts, the letters of recommendation, how to present your information and all of that. So I, I, I know we're getting close to that ending hour and I don't want people to leave with questions, uh, but do you have a, like a two second summary that you would want to share on that, Karen? Yeah, yeah I know, no pressure, right? No, no pressure. Um, letters of recommendation really help that admission counselor to get the information we can't get off of a transcript. So I think that keep that in mind when you're selecting who will write those letters of recommendation, who is going to present that persistence, who is going to present um, what happens when your student runs into difficulties, you know, who is going to present where your students major strengths or passions lie, you know, you don't necessarily know that in on a transcript. Um, So think about those things because that's what we're looking for. Again, when I read 
I'm highlighting in my mind certain words that I'm seeing in there and keeping those in mind so that I can take my notes on there. So kind of think about me sitting behind the screen, you know, reading that letter. What am I going to get out of that? Excellent. So follow up. We're going to share this video on our respective websites. And of course, then I share all over social media, um, <laughs> right? Uh, my, my, Grand estate home educator friends know I practically live there. Um, so for good or bad, but I'm there. And so if there are follow-up questions, you can you can reach out to Karen there at Neef. You can you I would hope all know how to find me by now. Uh, but you know, between our website and Facebook and our email, and our email is info at grandestatehomeeducators.org. We can do follow-up questions. So uh, I know this may be just the beginning of the journey for college for you, especially yeah. for our younger students, but uh, we're, we're here to help you. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you guys sticking with us tonight. I know it's a lot of information. This presentation in particular, because we're talking admissions and financial aid, tends to be kind of heavy, um, but it's important information. And I hope you know there was something in there that you got out of tonight that will help you going forward. Um, again, if you have questions, I'm going nowhere. I am um, at NEF. I've been at NEF for 22 years. Give me a shout out. Um, my colleagues in the office are fantastic too. If you don't happen to get me right away, um, you know, give them a shout out and they'll be willing to answer your questions as well. But um, we really enjoy working with you. Michelle and I are going to be offering a whole series of these types of presentations. So, you know, watch her website, watch our website. Um, to know when the next one's coming up. We're, we're working on that now. Um, but we, you know, or even if you have a suggestion as to what you would like us to, to be talking about, we'll take those too. Absolutely. I love working with Karen and I'm really glad that you joined us tonight. Thank you again. I hope you found this to be a valuable use of your time and uh, thank you for tuning in. It's been great. Thank you everyone. Have a great night. We appreciate it. Take care everyone. I'm just going to stop sharing and close that out for a moment. Um, but again, take care. Have a great night. Thank you.